Lord, that is our prayer. With gratitude, contemplating the fact that you, king over the universe, king of all kings, the Lord and ruler of all things, would be known by us, would make yourself known to us. These are rich and infinite privileges, of which we are not worthy, but you have made us to be partakers of. God, thank you. Thank you that we get to know you, that we get to be yours. Thank you that we have the rich inheritance of eternity in your presence and life here with you now. We pray this morning as we open your word that you would help us to think the way you think and to live for you and for others. May we be pleasing to you, O God. May you use your word this morning in our hearts to accomplish your purposes for your glory for the building up of your church, for the expansion of your gospel, and for our good. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Turn in your Bibles this morning to Romans chapter 12. We're continuing our look at the reign of grace. That is the dominion of undeserved kindness. Remember back in... Romans chapter 5, we were introduced to this idea that while once we were slaves of sin, while once we were under the dominion and tyranny of sin leading only to death, we have been transferred into a new realm, a new kingdom, a new dominion, with a new master, with a new outcome. And this reign of grace has set us free from slavery to sin and from the tyranny of law and has made us slaves of Christ and slaves to righteousness. We're beginning to see in Romans chapter 12 what that reign of grace looks like in flesh and blood. How does it work out in concrete terms? And we discover in Romans 12 the beginning of some down-to-earth exhortations. What does it look like when a life is sacrificed to God in a Romans 12 one way? What does it look like when a life is being overturned in the way that it thinks in a Romans 12, 2 way? We are undergoing that transformation, that metamorphosis by the power of God being transformed by the renewing of our mind. What does a life subject to the will of God actually look like? We're really asking the question, what is the Christian life like? What is the Christian life like? And the string of directives that unfold for us from chapter 12 onward are really the outfolding, the outworking of this sacrifice, dedicated, being metamorphosed life described in the, the beginning of Romans 12, 1 and 2. And at the top of this list, we find three things this morning, humility, connectedness, and service that make the top of the list for what does the Christian life look like. Abject humility, interdependent connection to the local church, and service of others with God's resources entrusted to us. That's what we find here in Romans 12, 3 to 8. Follow along as I read these verses, and I'll begin again in verse 1. Paul says, therefore, I urge you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment." as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. For just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly, if prophecy, according to the proportion of his faith, if service, in his serving, or he who teaches in his teaching, 
or he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. What we see here in these verses is the beginning of the reign of grace producing a life of worship. Romans 12, 3 to 8 details three marks of the reign of grace in the life of a believer. And the first mark, the first evidence, the first manifestation that grace has taken a hold in the life of one who believes is humility. Look at verse 3. Paul writes, For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think but to think so as to have sound judgment as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. What is marked out for the Christian life here is true humility, a right estimation of self. And true humility is a grace-given quality that goes against natural human tendency. The natural human tendency is to allow the universe to revolve around self to make the universe revolve around me. Self-esteem is the mantra of our day, and what we find here in this verse is the opposite of self-esteem. It is a right estimation of self that puts God's glory at the head and others' needs ahead of our own. And this goes against the way we think naturally. Notice the four at the beginning of verse 3. For through the grace given to me, this four is an explanation, and it links verse three and the charge to humility here with everything that has gone before. First of all, to God's grace in the gospel, the first 11 chapters of Romans, uh, the cascade of therefore in verse one to the four in verse three connects all of this to what Paul has detailed for us as he's explained the good news of the grace of God in the gospel of Jesus Christ in this letter to Romans. And you remember 11 chapters overturning God's indictment against human sin with the grace of God that brings forgiveness in Jesus Christ. There is no one who is righteous, no one who does good, not even one. But God is willing to declare righteous the ungodly who abandon works but simply trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ at the cross. And for all those who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ, God makes a declaration of righteousness, as if you had always done everything right and as if you had never done anything wrong, freely on the basis of faith. A remarkable thing. God's grace in the gospel is undeserved. It is contrary to our deserts. It is contrary to what we have earned, contrary to what we have merited. And God's grace levels pride. You see, you could never get to heaven on your own merits. You could never get to heaven on your own abilities. You could never get to heaven by just you being you. No, an absolute undoing of self was required. A turning away from you and a turning to Christ. An abandonment of all of your merits. And a clinging only to the Lord Jesus Christ. What an affront it is to the grace of God on the backside of grace as a Christian to exalt himself. Do you remember how the grace of God in the gospel explained in Romans terminates in Romans chapter 11? From him and through him and to him are all things to him be the glory forever, amen, Romans eleven thirty six. Therefore, present your bodies. Don't be conformed, but be transformed and be humble. To reject the grace of God and the gospel by pursuing a self-inflating pride is to turn the gospel on its head, to make me the center of all things, to say from me and through me and to me should be all things, to me be the glory forever, amen. And this is not what the gospel does in a humbled heart. The gospel leads to this very command in verse 1 where Paul urges us by the mercies of God to present our bodies as living sacrifices to God. Total, all-out dedication to Him. We are the sacrifice. We are the one offering the sacrifice. You bring the whole walking carcass of you to the altar of God in living service to Him. 
That is what it means to live under the reign of grace, dedicated sacrifice. And in verse 2, to not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, to not be squeezed into the mold of this world is always exerting its pressure on us, but rather to be transformed, metamorphosed by the renewing of our minds. We begin to think from the inside the way God thinks. We, we begin to have God's priorities and God's worldview. And, and here in verse 3, a right estimation of self. If you are being transformed by the renewing of your mind, you will see yourself differently than you did before. Now, this is a critical command for life as a Christian. We are to rethink everything. And, and this idea of the gospel in 11 chapters and dedicated sacrificial service to God as a fundamental aspect of the Christian life in 12.1 and a mind renewal in 12.2, this is a fantastic recipe for humility. I believe you cannot have true humility, true humility without these things. And these things rightly appropriated will produce a humble heart and a humble life. Notice that Paul says, for through the grace given to me. He highlights his own life. Paul himself was a trophy of God's grace. Paul was one who, according to Philippians 3, was sure that if anybody could have merited God's favor, it was him because of how great he was, because of his heritage, his lineage, and because of all of the good things he'd done. And when Paul came to a right estimation of those things, he saw them as garbage compared to the surpassing value of knowing Christ. Everything he had accrued, everything he had put up to his own account, he knew was trash, rubbish, to be completely discarded in exchange for having Christ. Paul knew what it was to be humbled. Paul knew what it was to be humbled on the Damascus Road. He was on his way to think he was serving God by persecuting Christians. And grace leveled him, blinded him, opened his eyes. And Paul was humbled in the Christian life as well. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And God was uniquely fitting this man to be a humble apostle to the Gentiles, to be uniquely gifted with a stewardship of a specific task that required a lot of knowledge and simultaneously a lot of humility, which can be a difficult combination. Notice in chapter 12, verse 1 of 2 Corinthians, Paul says, boasting is necessary, though not profitable. I will go to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, and he's talking about himself, but removing himself from the equation. I don't know whether I was in the body or out of the body, God knows. Such a man was caught up to the third heaven. That is not the sky, not space, but the very throne room of God, where God dwells. I was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words which a man is not permitted to speak. There, there is Paul's little statement. I, I could tell you what I saw and heard, but then I'd have to kill you, right? Paul's not allowed to say what he experienced in heaven. On behalf of such a man, I will boast. On my own behalf, I will not boast, except in regard to my weaknesses. I do not wish to boast. If I do wish to boast, I will be foolish, for I will be speaking the truth but I refrain from this so that no one will credit me with more than he sees in me or hears from me. And then notice verse 7, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself. Right? Paul makes it clear here. He was talking about himself in the first six verses. To keep me from exalting myself, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me, and he said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is perfected in weakness. Paul then went on to boast in those very weaknesses. Paul knew what it is like to be humbled, not only at salvation, but also in the course of his Christian life. And Paul knew how necessary this would be 
Paul here in Romans 3, 8, or 12, 8 calls it a grace. By the grace given to me, I say to you, be humble. Paul is modeling the very thing he is commanding. And if you think about a platform for the potential for pride, it would be one who saw heaven before the time and one who was elevated to the status of apostle, a foundational level office for the church. Only a limited number of men served in that capacity, receiving direct revelation from the Lord. It would be a temptation to be proud in that position. Paul was humble. And at times, Paul was humbled by the Lord. Paul was given from God a messenger of Satan to torment him with the express purpose of keeping him humble. Why? Because the truths that he experienced were so glorious, so wonderful, that Paul would have been tempted to think highly of himself just for having seen them. Did Paul deserve to get a glimpse of heaven? No, of course not. And yet Paul knew what was resident in the human heart, the residual depravity manifesting itself in pride that would have been crippling to the ministry of an apostle. God knew what Paul needed. I believe God knew that Paul needed a vision of heaven to sustain him through the trials he would endure uniquely as the apostle to the Gentiles. And God knew that Paul needed the humbling of a trial, a persistent, unrelenting torment to keep him humble based on what he knew and what he had seen. Paul knows from the very start that the kind of humility commanded here is supernatural. And so he says, to every one of you I say. And he's writing this letter to the churches at Rome, to the Christians in the churches at Rome, and no one is exempt. It is emphatic in the original, the way Paul says this, to each and every one of you, I write this. <laughs> no, one is, no one is exempt from this command to be humble. We all tend to overvalue our abilities. We tend to overvalue our own importance. One commentator wrote to himself, every man is, in a sense, the most important person in the world and is always in need of much grace. To overcome that tendency, I mean, just think about your own life. As much as we long for service of others, as much as we labor to be humble and to be a benefit to others, consider the hours in a day and the minutes in an hour and the seconds in a minute and calculate for yourself how many of those seconds are devoted to you thinking about you. Oftentimes, even in the context of serving others, we think about ourselves. It takes supernatural grace to get over this self-absorbed pride that is part of our nature. And Paul writes, I say to you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have right thinking. Literally, four times in the original, this word think is pressed upon us. There is a bit of a word play here, and, and really, this is the first application of mind renewal. We are to be renewed in the spirit of our minds. That is, the Christian life begins at the thought level, and what we do and how we think, subjecting our thoughts to God thought, God's thoughts, we truly need brainwashing in every good sense of that word. We are to run our brains under the faucet of God's word. And the first element of that thinking is to have right thinking about ourselves. When Paul says we are to not think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment. That last think word, sound judgment, it's a compound word and is often used to describe sobriety, to have sober thinking, to be sane, to, to not be impaired in our thinking by some substance. Sobriety in, in thinking is a contrast to thinking highly of yourself. You see, pride is an intoxicating thought pattern. It inhibits our responses. It dulls the senses. It cripples our perceptions of others. It blinds us to others' needs. To be humble is to sober up concerning yourself. Yourself. 
and your place in God's economy. A right estimate can never be other than a very humble one, since whatever there is of good in us is not of ourselves, but of God, says Charles Hodge. If you're going to think about yourself rightly, you must think about yourself humbly. Anything else is running away from the truth. If there is anything good in you, it is God's. If there is anything good in you, it is produced by the Holy Spirit. It comes purchased by Christ, and it is placed by God himself. You and I have nothing to boast in in our former life outside of Christ. And in our life in Christ, we only have to boast in Christ. Pride is an inflated view of self. God's grace is designed to level that, to pop that inflated view. Now listen, pride is a recipe for discouragement. I know our world tells us you can't love others until you learn to love yourself. Listen, you already love yourself too much. That's the problem. We esteem self too highly. Mankind's problem is not a lack of self-esteem. It is a lack of Christ-esteem and others' esteem. It is an inflation of self-esteem that is our problem. And listen, this inflation of self-esteem is a recipe for discouragement. If you esteem self, then you long for others to esteem your self. And when they don't, when others don't prop you up and compliment you in the ways that you feel you deserve, you will be discouraged. You lived your life not on the basis of God's estimation of you, Listen, you're loved, Christian. But on what others think of you, others can't possibly live up to the self-inflated view that I'm tempted to think about me. And when I begin to demand that others think about me the way that I wish they think about me, I will only be disappointed. The spiritual gifts that Paul will outline in this passage are given not for self-exaltation, but for the benefit of others. We ought to be willing to do things that are most useful, not the things that are necessarily most attractive or most noticed or most, most appreciated and applauded by others. Pride is so sneaky. Even when we're engaging in selfless, sacrificial service for others, we kind of want others to know about it. We want others to see it, to applaud it. And we will fail to serve or cease to serve if it's not appreciated. But here, with all the apostolic authority from a man who was humbled by God as a trophy of grace and humbled throughout life, Paul commands us, think rightly about yourself. Think humbly, as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. And here, Paul says something a little bit uh, confusing, I think. The the, the idea that uh, each Christian has been given different capacities for trusting in God. I think that is exactly what he's describing here. Every Christian is different. Every Christian's expression of faith is different. And according to the various capacities that everyone has been given by God, we are to be dependent on the grace of God. This does not get anybody off the hook. Well, I don't have enough faith to be humble. The point is, everyone who is a child of God has been given faith as a gift, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. And that grace gift of God, which is faith, produces a fundamental humility that you and I are charged here to cultivate. With the full weight of apostolic authority, grounded in the grace of God and the gospel, to think rightly about self. A tragic thing has happened to the American church. In the 20th century, uh, one man almost single-handedly reshaped the whole biblical notion of self-esteem. 
Robert Schuller was the pastor of the Crystal Cathedral for many years and was the one whose sermons were heard by more people in church history than any other. And he wrote a book called Self-Esteem, The New Reformation. And he took all of the terms of Reformation doctrine, justification, salvation, sin. He took all of these soteriological words, salvation words, and he redefined them. He defined sin as anything that robs a human of his self-esteem. And he said that I'm not sure that anybody who thinks he's a sinner can possibly ever embrace the grace of God. This was a tragic rewriting of God's indictment against the human condition. And the gospel of self-esteem is no gospel at all. It is a message propping up a false idea of man's value, replacing the very thing that God intended man to be with a man-centered approach to pride. This is not the Christian life. Through grace comes right thinking of self, sound thinking, sober thinking about self. And this humility that fundamentally undergirds all of the Christian life leads us to another reality in verses 4 and 5, and it is our interdependence. What does the Christian look like? First of all, humility. Secondly, interdependence. That is, you are dependent on others as a Christian by God's design, and others are dependent on you. Look at verse 4. For just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Again, in verse 4, the, the little word for is explanatory. Paul is giving the explanation in verse 4 for a right estimation of ourselves. Why should we look at ourselves with humility? Why should we run away from an inflated view of self. Because in verse 4, we recognize that we are interdependently connected to others in the church. You do not belong to yourself. If you are a Christian, you have been placed by God into what Paul uses as a metaphor here, a body. You are part of a community of believers expressed in local interdependent relationships in the church. And Paul uses a favorite metaphor here in verses 4 and 5. He compares the church to a physical body. And just as a physical body has many parts, and those parts aren't the same. There is diversity in a physical body, and there is unity in a physical body, and there is interdependence in a physical body. All of the various parts of a body function in different ways and bring benefit to the other parts of the body. Your elbow cannot say, I'm tired of being an elbow on this lousy body. I'm going to take a hike. Elbows can't hike without legs and feet. And if the elbow leaves, the forearm can no longer be connected to the body and is facing serious problems. This metaphor of a physical body is a fantastic illustration for the way God has designed local churches to operate. So the church, like a body, has many members, and yet all the members are one, and we are together in Christ, and according to verse 5, we are members of one another. Do you feel this, Christian? That the people around you in this very room are members of you. They are a part of you by God's design, and you a part of them by God's design. The Christian life is one of being placed into this body, and it means two things simultaneously. You are far less important than you think you are, and you are far more important than you think you are. You are not the whole body. Every member is placed, gifted by God, and important. Every member is just a member. But you wouldn't say to, about any of the members of your body, oh, that's just a lung. <laughs> that's just my left leg. Uh, 
every member is critical to the proper functioning of the whole body. No member of the body of Christ can effectively live the Christian life alone, and the local church is crippled when individual members of the body are not vitally connected to the body and operating appropriately. Freedom, independence, lone rangerism, self-sufficiency, these are American virtues. This is not the Christian life. The New Testament knows nothing of a lone ranger Christian. And think about this, at the very top of the list of what does the Christian look like? Grace of God unfolded in the gospel, living sacrifices, not squeezed into the mold of this world, but being transformed by the renewing of your mind. Okay, Paul, what does it look like in concrete terms? At the top of the list, humility and vital connection to the local body of believers. Right at the top of the list. Are you connected? Are you connected, Christian, in interdependent relationships in the body of Christ? Does the church feel it when you're not there? Do you feel it when you're not with the church? Do you feel it when others are missing? Do you know the people around you? Do you know their needs? Do you pray for them? Are you meeting together to confess sins to one another, to encourage one another, to carry it out all the 20 plus commands of the one another commands in the New Testament? Are you in a small group at Grace Bible Church? That is a fantastic vehicle for being a part of the body, being vitally connected to others in the body of Christ. This is one of the fundamental features of being a Christian. Being connected to one another in, in vital ministry. The last area that Paul details for us in Romans 12, 3 to 8 is service. We are to be humble, we are to be connected, and we are to serve. Look at verse 6. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. If prophecy, according to the proportion of his faith. If service in his serving, or he who teaches in his teaching. He who exhorts in his exhortation. He who gives with liberality. He who leads with diligence. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Notice, first of all, that we are given differing gifts according to God's grace. Christian, you are supernaturally gifted by God for service in the body through humility and interconnected interdependence with other people in the body to actually use those supernatural gifts for the benefit of others. In Ephesians 4, 7, these gifts are said to be given by Christ. In 1 Corinthians 12, they're said to be given by the Holy Spirit. Here they are attributed to God's grace these are sovereignly appointed, undeserved, supernatural giftings given by God for the employment of believers and the service of other believers in the context of the body of Christ, the church. I'll say that again. These spiritual gifts are sovereignly appointed, undeserved, supernatural giftings given by God for the employment of believers in the service of other believers in the context of the body of Christ, the church. And no one has anything that he did not receive, right? Paul has to tell the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 4, 7, why do you boast as if these things weren't freely given to you by God? These are grace gifts. And the word here for gifts is charismata. These are those which stem from charis or grace. These are the grace gifts of God. These are manifestations of spiritual abilities distributed by God according to his plan for his purposes, benefiting his people. And there are seven of them listed here. Service, prophecy, teaching, exhortation, giving, leading, and showing mercy. 
these is, this is not an exhaustive list. There are other lists of these charismata, these gifts given by God for the benefit of the church. And some of these overlap with others. Some of these are unique to this passage. I think the fact that none of the lists are the same probably indicates that there is not a, a technical differentiation between all of them. Some of them overlap. And it's likely that while some were very specific and very obvious and could be delineated by observation, no specific technical instructions are given for what they are or exactly how to do them. There's never a, some sort of a survey in the New Testament for figuring out which gift is yours, but merely the instructions to go serve with them. Here in Romans 12, there are no technical definitions, there are no lengthy descriptions, no operator's manual, just the simple instruction to do them. Notice in verse 6, if prophecy, prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Notice the next verse, if service, then in serving. If teaching, then in teaching. If exhortation, then in exhorting. There's not specific instructions about what these are or how to do them, but simply the encouragement to be employing what God has given you for the benefit of believers connected to you in the church. And if you're not vitally connected in interdependent relationship in the body of Christ, you're missing out on what God has graciously provided through others for your benefit. And if you are not vitally connected in interdependent relationship in the body of Christ, you are keeping from others the benefit that God has entrusted, has intended by entrusting you with supernatural gifting. There is a stewardship of what God has given each and every Christian in the body of Christ. And let's take a few moments to look at this representative list. The first one Paul mentions is prophecy. Prophecy is the gift, supernatural gifting, of being able to declare truth previously unrevealed, to declare truth previously unrevealed. This is a gift of direct revelation. By the way, I want you to turn to Ephesians 2.20 and see that this gift was foundational to the church. This is going to help us understand what Paul has in mind here. In speaking to the church at Ephesus, Paul writes... You are no longer strangers and aliens, verse 19. You are fellow citizens with the saints. You are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. Here, the prophets is clearly a reference to New Testament prophets. And we know these are New Testament prophets for several reasons. Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone of the building, the first stone that was laid and Messiah was not revealed as Jesus of Nazareth until Bethlehem. Jesus Christ, the first stone laid, comes before what's listed next. And the next uh, office listed is apostles. We didn't have Old Testament apostles. We have New Testament apostles who are the foundation of the church. And this order is critical. Apostles and prophets are the foundation of the church. Church birthed in Acts 2. And in the first generation of the church, what was the foundation of this building that God is building? Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone, and the foundation level of building, the apostles and the New Testament prophets. Now, this is a critical task, a, a critical gift for the foundation era of the church. By the way, if you build a, a large building, multiple stories, you build a foundation one time, hopefully. Hopefully. That's been true in church history. The foundation was laid one time. We do not have apostles today. Apostles are foundational. We do not have prophets today. They were foundational. This gift was the gift of receiving direct revelation. And how was this to be done? According to Romans 12, according to the proportion of his faith. If you were a New Testament era prophet, how were you to exercise this gift of prophecy? Only according to faith. That is, only according to what you believed God was actually giving by direct revelation. To go beyond that would have been a wrong use. 
And listen, it would have been a temptation for any prophet who was human and had residual depravity manifesting itself in pride, it would have been a temptation in pride to wear the badge of prophet and to begin to give one's own opinions and one's own ideas while being known as a prophet in the foundational era of the church. That would have been crippling to the ministry of prophecy. By the way, in Deuteronomy 18, Old Testament prophets were to be tested, right? If they, were to give, if they gave predictive prophecy and it didn't come true, they took the prophet outside and threw rocks at him till he was dead. If he gave prophecy that contradicted God's previous revelation, they took him outside and threw rocks at him until he was dead. Likewise, New Testament prophets were to be tested examined to make sure that what they said was absolutely true. This is a very severe, binding encouragement on the use of this gift, only in proportion to faith. You don't go beyond that. And listen, a human who had the gift of prophecy could perhaps love the notoriety of being a prophet. So have your mind renewed. Don't have a high estimation of self. Use your gifts, but if prophecy, only in appropri appropriation with faith. And of course, this instruction was given in a time when the gift of prophecy was critical to the well-being of the church. You recognize that the church at Rome, prior to the writing of this letter, did not have the book of Romans. The churches in the New Testament did not yet have the New Testament, how are they going to operate under the new covenant? How are they going to operate under God's direction for living the Christian life, which was different than living under Mosaic law, different than living with a barrier dividing Jew and Gentile? This was new. How would they know how to live, how to operate? How would they be exhorted and encouraged? They could not stand up on a Sunday morning and say, turn in your Bibles to Jude or to Revelation or to 2 Corinthians but the office, the foundational gift of New Testament prophet was critical so that direct revelation from God could be heard. By the way, I know there's a movement today or there's a theological perspective that says that uh, New Testament prophecy is different than Old Testament prophecy. A um, uh, very prominent theologian uh, whose books we read subscribes to the idea that New Testament prophecy can change, it can be fallible, it can be errant. Uh, that idea is foreign to the scriptures. Nothing in the Bible changes the definition of prophet. Nothing in the Bible changes the qualifications of prophet or the standards to which prophecy was to be met. New Testament prophets, like Old Testament prophets, told the future, revealed what was concealed, both concealed by God and concealed in the hearts of men, and they provided transcendent divine revelation beyond the ability of human thinking to apprehend. That was the role of an Old Testament prophet and a New Testament prophet, and it always had to be right, could never err. Why? Because God does not lie, and prophecy is the conveying of direct revelation. The next gift that's given, I don't know, there's not really a direct application for us from prophecy. There will be when it comes to teaching, which, by the way, the New Testament is the, re the record of, of the first generation level of prophetic revelation that came through the apostles and the prophets. The second gift listed here is service. It comes from the idea of waiting at tables. It was the position of a lowly servant. We get our word deacon from this word, and it can mean the ministry of the office of a deacon or, at times, the general ministry of all Christians. And notice what Paul says here. If you are gifted in service in his serving. It's not quite a complete sentence. The idea is, if you're gifted in service, then just serve. Serve. Specific instructions are not given, but just live out the very thing you've been stewarded with. Live out the very thing you've been entrusted with. Go do it. If teaching, then teach. Teaching is explanation of what God has already revealed. It is truth-telling, like prophecy is truth-telling. But where prophecy is direct revelation, teaching is the explanation of what God has revealed. It is uninspired. And the one who is teaching must study, must be diligent. It is a systematic explanation of the truth that requires labor. And if you're gifted in teaching, teaching, 
then teach. Next, Paul says exhortation. If you're gifted in exhortation, then exhort. Exhortation is encouragement to obey the word. The exhorter helps people to think through specifically how to live out God's directives. An exhorter is one who calls believers to obey. He, he encourages, he pleads, he warns, he comforts, he strengthens, at times he admonishes. And if you're gifted in exhortation, exhort. These three, service, teaching, and exhortation, are given direction in terms of their sphere. Right? If, you serve, if, you're, if you have the gift of service, then serve. If you have the gift of teaching, then teach. If you have the gift of exhortation, then exhort. But the next three have a little bit of instruction in regard to the manner, how to do them, what should characterize the operation of these gifts. And Paul says, if giving, he who gives, verse 8, do so with liberality. Literally, the original says, do so with singleness. That is, singleness of mind, singleness of purpose. Give without mixed motives. Give without regret. Oh, man, I can't, I can't believe I just gave that away. Give generously, liberally. The next gift listed is leading, to lead or, in some cases, to exercise a position of leadership. This is used of church leadership in 1 Thessalonians 5 and of elders specifically in 1 Timothy 5. And when you think about leadership and you think about the, the way the world thinks about leadership, the world's view of leadership is grounded in ambition, ladder that you must climb, and people often are the rungs of that ladder that you must climb on to get to where you want. The mantra of the world is lead, follow, or what? Get out of the way. And the idea is I'm going to go excel at the hustle and I'm going to be a leader because everyone else is going to follow what I'm doing. I'm going to lead by example in getting what I want. That may be the world's view of leadership. It is not the Bible's view of leadership. What does leadership in the church look like? Often the same as the world, where the church gets squeezed into the mold of the world. But what should, what should leadership in the church look like? Humble, faithful, selfless service. The kind where the last are first. The kind that John the Baptist exemplified. Jesus must increase and I must decrease. By the way, he had his prayer answered. He decreased rather immediately. And Jesus increased. This is exemplified by the Apostle Paul. Just read 2 Corinthians to get a, a flavor of the heart of Paul who was maligned and misunderstood and mistreated again and again and again by the people that he loved and served and led. Well, if I'm humble before people, they'll treat me like a doormat. That's right. That's true. Of course, New Testament biblical leadership that Paul is calling leaders to here is that of Christ. Jesus Christ himself, on the very night that he was betrayed, washed his disciples' feet, took on the form of the lowliest servant to do the menial task that no one would stoop to do. And he says, you guys do this for each other. That is a biblical view of leadership. And notice how Paul says leaders are to lead. He who leads with diligence. That is, you, you labor at it. There, there is a, a zeal for it. There is an, an effort in this. Right? If any man desires the office of overseer, it is a good work that he desires. Leaders are to lead with diligence. And then the final gift Paul lists is the showing of mercy. This is an open heart of sympathy and love and meeting the needs of those in a pitiable condition. This is the only time, by the way, this word for mercy is used as a verb of people. It's used often of God. God shows mercy, but here believers are to show mercy as grace gifted by God to do so. And probably what's in view here is the care for the sick and the afflicted, the elderly, the poor and disabled, people who can't give back 
And notice, this is to be done with cheerfulness. With cheerfulness. Don't go serve in mercy with a grudging spirit, mopey, complaining, talking about how hard it is to serve people that are hard to serve. That kind of service does not bring joy to the afflicted. Instead, it makes people feel like they're a burden. You don't let people know how hard it is to serve them when they're suffering. If you've been in the hospital and you've had a bad nurse, you know what that's like. They don't want to be there. They can't wait to clock out. You're just a burden. And if you've experienced the other kind, it's such a comfort. And people are not burdens or obstacles or enemies or inconveniences to the Christian life. Calvin wrote, For as nothing gives more solace to the sick or to anyone otherwise distressed than to see men cheerful and prompt in assisting them, so to observe sadness in the countenance of those by whom assistance is given makes them feel despised. All of these gifts here are grace gifts. They're not earned. They're not deserved. They're not for you. These are special giftings from God, but they are limited. Nobody has every gift. We need each other. By the way, no Christian can say, well, I'm just not gifted. I don't have to serve. Some grace gifts are supernatural ability to do the things that all Christians are commanded to do. Take giving, for instance. We're all to be sacrificial givers. A grace gift to give is to do so super abundantly, supernaturally. But everybody's to give liberally, cheerfully. Everybody is to serve the word for ministry. In Ephesians 4, 12, pastors are giving for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. All Christians do the work of ministry. You can't say, oh, ministry is not my gift. Serving's not my gift. Some of these gifts detail what all Christians are supposed to do. Even teaching, Colossians 3, 16. We teach one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs as we gather together as a body. Even exhorting, Colossians 3, 16. You can't say I'm off the hook for speaking the truth in love to one another. What are we to do in relationship to one another with these various gifts? Well, don't envy. Don't boast. Don't oppose others using their gifts. Don't hoard gifts as if they're all for yourself and not for the benefit of others. Don't be self-absorbed by saying either, look at my gifts or look at all those gifts I don't have. Both of those are manifestations of pride. But humbly serve with diligence, employing these undeserved grace gifts from God for the benefit of others. Christian, are you humble? Humbled by the grace of God, cultivating humility? Are you connected, vitally connected in interdependent relationship in the body of Christ? And are you serving? using what God has given you in the body of Christ for the benefit of others. What, is the, what does the reign of grace look like? Humbled by grace, vitally connected, stewards of God's grace gifts. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the ways that you turn us inside out, reshape and remake us useful, beneficial to others, able to bring you glory, living up to the very reasons that you created us. God, we pray that we would pursue these things as those sacrificed to you every day, being transformed by your word at the heart level, working its way out into real life and service in your church. We ask it in Jesus' name.